If we turn back to that section of Mark chapter 9, as we look through that uh, chapter in the life of Christ and his disciples. I'm not sure if you're from that era where your family talked about their hopes that you would go to university. That Remember, I think 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 1950s, 60s, 70s, that is. Um, families used to talk a lot about the, that hope for the upward mobility of their family. I hope you get what I never had the opportunity to get. I hope you manage to go to university, get that big job, push the family name higher. Upward mobility. It was that desire, and still is the desire, isn't it, that we better ourselves, that we become stronger, better known uh, in this world. And of course, the Bible encourages us to work hard and renew the creation through investment and innovation and working hard and striving to make good in this world. But that drive can also become an idolatrous thing when it becomes all about me and about myself. I want to be known. I want to be big in this world. I want to be famous. I want people to look at me and say how grand and how great I am. Reach the top of my little kingdom by any legitimate means possible. And people will say what a person they are. Well, as we come to this chapter in the life of Christ and his students, we discover the 12 disciples and they are longing for upward mobility in Christ's kingdom. But Jesus doesn't view that as a healthy desire. As they seek to become known and famous for being connected to the Messiah. I should be great. I am great. And so Jesus seeks to show them a better way, the way of humility, a way that reflects him and the reality of his kingdom to this world. And so first of all, in verses 30 to 32, if you have your Bibles open, we see Christ who's the king above all kings. He's the God of gods, the Lord of lords. And he reveals again to them his downward mobility, that he hasn't come to earth to say, look how amazing I am in that one sense, in that sense of pride and selfishness. But he has come to be the servant of all. He says here, doesn't he? He says, that he is the son of man. And that as the son of man, he is about to suffer many things and be killed before rising again. Now that's a a more remarkable statement than we might first realize because the title son of man was a very exalted title in the Old Testament. The prophet Daniel, he talks about this much and he talks about how there will be one day this incredible, glorious, majestic king who would come to earth in this bright and overwhelming majesty and display of glory to judge the world in absolute power. So in Daniel 7, verses 13 to 14, he says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom shall not be destroyed. This son of man figure that they were longing for was this glorious ruler, this judge of all the earth, before whom every nation would bow. But in the Old Testament, there was a suffering servant figure who was also promised. A suffering servant who would be a sacrifice for sinners, who would be the opposite to the Son of Man in all his glory. This suffering servant, he would die. Isaiah, the prophet, he speaks of him in chapter 53, verse 3 of Isaiah. Talking of the suffering servant, he says, he was despised, rejected by men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. 
As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Two figures, glorious son of man, a despised and forsaken suffering servant over here. And so they are expecting at some point in their history for this suffering servant to come. But now they are with the Son of Man as he's just called himself. They are in the place of glory, the place where this king rules, whose dominion over the world will be like no other. And yet what does Jesus do here? He combines these two figures, these two long expected men who would come. He says that it is the all-glorious Son of Man who will also be the suffering servant, despised, rejected, and killed. The all-glorious King, who every knee before whom every knee will bow, who will see his majesty and his greatness, that he is also the one who none will esteem, the shamed one will also be the glorious one. Jesus is saying here, these are not two figures. In him they are combined. They are one person. The killed one will be the risen one. The suffering one will be the son of man one. So why does he teach them this? Well, he's saying that there's no other door into my glorious kingdom than through the door of my suffering. If you want to be a part of the Son of Man's dominion and kingdom and glory and majesty, you can only enter through the death of Christ, the killed and suffering one. There's no other way. You enter into the Son of Man glory through the humble, suffering servant. We are welcomed through the door of the kingdom, into the rule, the rule and reign of Christ over the doormat of the Son of Man's death. I'm sure we've all heard that phrase, haven't we? The over my dead body, right? We, we use it very negatively. We say, you are, you are allowed in my house over my dead body, meaning... You'll never be allowed in my house. I will forgive you over my dead body, meaning I'll never, ever forgive you. But Christ flips that and means the exact opposite when he says it. He says, you will be welcomed into my kingdom, literally over my dead body. You will be forgiven over my dead body. Because in his death, he will accomplish everything necessary to forgive us and to bring us into his own kingdom. So when Jesus says that, he's saying, you're welcomed in to the glory, into the majesty of the Son of Man over the suffering and death of this suffering servant. This is the great hope of the world, that the glorious God the Son of God, Jesus Christ, has given himself to death that those who deserve death might be received, welcomed into his kingdom. We don't march into the kingdom of God saying, God, look how amazing I am. Don't you want to accept a person so great as I am? No, we enter by trusting a suffering servant who has been killed that I might live. This is all counterintuitive, this gospel, this Christian message. For so often we think, you know, I must raise myself. I must become better than ever before in order for God to accept me. If I can prove to him I'm worthy of his kingdom, then he'll say, welcome but Jesus is saying the very reverse. He's saying, I want you to wipe your sinful, dirty heart on the door, doormat of my death. And then if you, if you are cleansed through my suffering, you can come. You can enter in with boldness that you, the despised and rejected, the, the forsaken and the humbled <clears throat> You, the, clean, the, the dirty and unclean, can be cleansed by my suffering. 
You can be washed in my blood and you can be welcomed in to glory. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying becoming a Christian is a humbling thing. Because it's easy to serve God for acceptance. But it's very difficult to be willing to be served by him. To say to the Lord Jesus, I have no right to come into your kingdom. I have failed in a million ways, but I have sinned. And so I come and I rest upon your finished work at Calvary. It's, it's difficult to be served by Christ. Remember the apostle Peter who, he says, Jesus says, come and let me wash your feet. And Peter says to Jesus, no, you're never going to wash my feet. He's far too big for that, far too proud for Jesus to wash his feet. And Jesus says, unless I wash you, Peter, you, can be, you cannot be part of my kingdom. It's harder to be served by Jesus than to serve Jesus. But being served by Jesus is the only way into his kingdom because he's the suffering servant, the son of man. And if we are willing to be served by him this morning and to say, thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you for suffering, taking upon yourself the sins of the world for taking my place there on the cross. Will you wash me? Will you serve me? Will you cleanse me? If we are willing to be served by Christ, then Christ says, you're in the right place. Come in. You're welcome. Come and sit with me at the table of the king. The whole idea literally messes with the heads of self-righteous, important people. Remember the Pharisees who thought they were good enough for the kingdom of God? And they, they looked at what Jesus was doing, and one verse in Scripture says, the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. What is he doing? Why is he down there? Not up here with us, the great and the good. You know, you can tell when you're proud. You can tell when you're self-righteous. When it annoys you that God forgives wretches, evil people, before he forgives you. That he welcomes the outcast when he doesn't welcome you. Jesus knows of nothing more enjoyable than welcoming the sinner the ones who have rebelled against him most, the ones who hang him upon the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. This is whom Christ loves, the failures, the outcasts, the ones with no rights, the ones who are sinners, the ones far from him. He says, you're welcome. Come in. And so while the self-righteous get strong warnings from him, it's the vulnerable and the prostitutes and the thieves, the tax collectors, and the terrorists that Jesus says welcome to. It's only when we are willing to put ourselves in the sinner category and say, yes, that's where I belong. It's then when Jesus says, welcome, welcome into my kingdom. You've, you're humble enough to come in. But when you say, I'm good enough, I go to church, I pray three times a day. I come to the prayer meetings, read my Bible, I, I pray on my own, I pray with others. I'm amazing. God must accept me then. God says, you're in the wrong place. You need to be humbled. Now, this is hugely important, isn't it? It's something that the disciples were not grasping. And this is what we see secondly in verses 33 to 37. For while Christ desired downward mobility to serve, the disciples were desiring upward mobility in his kingdom. Here are the disciples not grasping the way of entrance into the kingdom. They didn't understand the necessity of this continued attitude while in the kingdom. And so they were muttering among themselves. They were having a disagreement. They were like naughty children in a schoolyard. And the teacher comes up to them and says, what are you arguing about? And they're like, oh, nothing, nothing. Not saying anything. But they were arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom, which is incredibly embarrassing when you're in front of the king of kings, isn't it? 
What are you arguing about? Mm, just about who's the greatest in your kingdom? You can understand it in a sense, can't you? Because if Jesus is the Son of Man, if he is this all-glorious conquering king, then they were his right-hand men. Some of them had been sent out on mission by him. He's like, you're good enough to be my representatives in this world. So they're like, well, I'm obviously important to him. Some of them, had, three of them, had been up a mountain with him and seen him in his glory so that they saw him for who he really was, while the rest had been left behind. So obviously us three were better than those lot at the bottom of the mountain. Some of them were saying, well, I did this. Jesus took me with him to pray. Didn't take you. Well, I went up the mountain. You didn't go up the mountain. <laughs> they're having this little argument, this little bicker. And their attitude as citizens of the kingdom was standing in stark contrast to the king of the kingdom. For while he was seeking to go lower, they were seeking to go higher. While he was being humble, they were clearly being proud. While in the kingdom of God, Jesus is saying it's humility, it's servanthood that are at the heart of my kingdom. This is what it looks like to be great in my kingdom. Not how amazing am I, but how many people have I served? How have I helped others? How have I lifted up others? Because when, it, when Jesus said it's the meek who inherit the earth, he is determined the course direction of all those who follow him to his glory. And it's found not in fame or in fortune, but in giving up our own rights for the benefits of others. Even if that should mean our own self-sacrifice, even if it should mean giving up our own lives for others, as Christians, we must have great aspirations in the kingdom. But the great aspiration is not to be seen in proving how amazing we are while other people are not as great as us. The aspiration is not to be puffed up while others are pushed down. But it's to be seen in our passion to serve one another. Not to become lords and kings, but to become servants of all. Because the glory of our God is not just seen on a mountain transfiguration where God speaks and says, this is my son. But it's also to be seen, best of all, as Jesus is bleeding out on a cross. That's where glory is seen. And so to show them this, Jesus asks his students to sit down. He says, bring me a child, bring a child. And the child comes into the middle of the circle, and the, and the disciples are gathered around, and Jesus here gives him a big hug, this child. And the description here is fascinating, because what do we see? We see the disciples, they were all visually on the outside of the circle. And who's on the inner circle? The child and Jesus. Because of their pride, because of their desire to be upwardly mobile, to be great and to push others down, Jesus says, actually, your pride is pushing you outwards while this child is being drawn inwards to the place of power, the place of authority in the kingdom. Now, if you remember, children in that society, in that culture, had no rights at all. Even the slave of the, of the house, who would be the teacher of the house, had the rights to beat the child if the child wasn't learning fast enough. There was the master of the house, the, the parents of the house, then there were the slaves, and bottom of all were the children of the house. No rights at all, and yet here Jesus welcomes the child into the heart of the inner circle before turning to his own disciples and saying, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, receives not me, but him who sent me. What is he saying? Well, look at verse 35. He says, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Here are the disciples bickering. I want to be the greatest. Pretty sure I'm the greatest. Nah, I'm the greatest. And Jesus says, okay, you want to be the greatest? Here's how to go about it. To be first, you've got to be last. 
And those last with the least rights in society are closest to my heart because they reflect my own heart as the forsaken and the despised and suffering servant. And if you want to know if you're truly great, ask, do you welcome this child into your inner circle? Or do you think you're better than them? Would you step on them to lift yourself up higher? For true greatness is seen in your humility. And humility is seen in how you welcome outcasts, rejects of society, people with no rights in this world. How do you welcome them? And do you welcome them like Christ? You see, our own heart attitude is to reflect Christ's in his kingdom. If our heart attitude, if the spirit of our lives contradicts that of our king, it is declaring to the world that we don't belong to this king or this kingdom, for his kingdom is a kingdom of humility and servanthood and suffering for the sake of lifting others up. <clears throat> so if maybe this morning, apologies if you did, if you visited this morning, and I'm just about to use you as an example, I haven't seen who drove what. But if, if someone visited this church this morning, and they're well-dressed, middle-class family, and they drove up in their Mercedes uh, with their 2.4, perfectly well-behaved children, and uh, I hope that wasn't you, because I, I haven't seen your car, but <laughs> if it is, I apologize in advance. But if you, if you see them driving up, and you see this perfectly behaved family like welcome we really love to see you this morning and then just behind them there's a homeless shoeless man with matted beard you're like oh can you just sit in the back corner do you mind the way we welcome others indicates what we think the kingdom of god really looks like does our understanding of the kingdom of heaven Look more like a sanitized A-list celebrity's mansion or like Christ's homeless, penniless wanderings towards a bloodied cross. For who we welcome with warmth and who we shy away from in this church is an indicator of where we are spiritually. Are we making progress towards inheriting the earth? Well, it's the meek that do that. So who do we welcome? Who do we draw close to in this church? And who do we shy away from? It's a great indicator of our own selves. Our reaction tells us whether we were a truly great person in the kingdom or not. It tells us, it preaches a message of whether we understand the basic Christian message or not. How we receive, how we welcome someone it's an outward expression of an inward spiritual condition. And if there are some who are needy and struggling and poor and outcasts maybe of society, we say, I don't want to be near those. I want to be near those, the, the upwardly mobile, the professionals. I want to be near those. We're preaching to ourselves that we are too proud for the kingdom. Our welcome is a mirror that reflects back to ourselves the state of our own spirituality or lack thereof. Now, if we live realizing that we are all in reality, no more than dirty sinners deserving God's judgment, but receiving only God's grace by his mercy, if we realize that, if we realize that we have been welcomed into his kingdom, not because we deserved it, but because we didn't deserve it, if we grasp this morning that the only reason we are a Christian is because God's undeserved mercy came to us in our wretchedness and picked us up from our pit and saved us, then we will welcome everyone else to the church with a warm embrace. And everyone else in society who is needy and vulnerable, we will welcome them as we reflect Jesus Christ. Did the disciples learn from this as this no right child is now at the right hand of the king while they are out on the outskirts, while the child has been proved to be the greatest of all? 
while they have proved themselves too big for the kingdom, you'd think that they learnt. And yet what happens next shows that they still haven't fully grasped this. Because what does uh, it say in verse 38? Now John answered Jesus. What is he answering? Jesus saying, you need to be a servant of all. Whoever receives this little child in my name, Jesus, uh, John answers him, verse 38, saying, Teacher, we've seen someone who's not part of us, and they're doing things in your name. They're different to us. They're casting out demons, and they're doing it in the name of Jesus, but they're not in the inner core of us 12 great ones. They oppose Satan, but they also oppose those who oppose Satan from outside their own grouping, don't they, his disciples? They're saying outsiders surely don't have the same rights as we do to be involved in kingdom work. Unless they're close to you and have self-declared themselves to be a follower of the Lord Jesus, surely they don't have the same rights as us. There's a sense here, isn't there, of them self-protecting their own turf, there's a sense of jealousy, maybe a hint of fear that this, if the child can take their place, then this unknown person casting out demons will also take their place and they'll be pushed further and further out. After all, this man is successfully casting out demons and they have so recently, earlier in Mark 9, failed to cast out a demon themselves. So this man is far more successful in the name of Jesus than they are. So he's going to be drawn in, isn't he? And they're going to be pushed further out. If the child's sitting at the right hand of Jesus in the kingdom, then this man's probably going to sit at the left hand, and where are we? So what shall we do? Jesus says, do not forbid him, for whoever is not against us is on our side. How would we feel if the church down the road sees revival in Cardiff? It passes us by. How would we feel as, maybe if you're a preacher here this morning, when someone, God blesses someone else's ministry more than yours? Or perhaps you're in work and you've witnessed for years about Jesus Christ to a friend in work and have not understood it. And a new colleague comes in and they were a Christian and they tell the person the gospel once and the person goes, ah, oh, I get it now. <laughs> I want to become a Christian. I want to follow Christ. And I want to come to your church. And say, I've witnessed to them for four years. How would we feel? Our reaction to those things reveals where we are in regards to humility and pride. Doesn't John say the spirit blows where he wills? We hear his sound. We don't know where he's come from or where he's going. It's God's work, isn't it? And so true spiritual greatness can be seen most clearly when if God is glorified, no matter how he does it or how he chooses to blow his spirit through the churches and through our land, we go, God's at work. Isn't it fantastic? Isn't it wonderful? We see true spiritual greatness in meekness, in humility, in serving others, because the striving to glorify God is a working towards becoming more and more like the Son of Man who suffered and bled and died. Our upward mobility in the kingdom is actually a downward mobility. It's making ourselves less, that others might become more, that they may see Christ for who he truly is. And so may we be truly a great church here in Gabalva. How? By welcoming everyone, however dark their pasts, however sinful their present lives, however broken they currently are, may we show the warmth, the love of Christ, the very warmth that he has shown to us. And may people's hearts be melted as we go away this morning with renewed love for the outcast, the stranger, the terrorist, the person with no rights, the broken and the lost, as we go out like a great army of God saying, how can I serve you? How can I love you? How can I build you up? 
of all places in Cardiff, surely it is the churches that should be the most grace-filled, warm places, the places where the servants of Cardiff are seen, where we seek to exalt others by bringing them to a humble Christ who gave himself for them. As our last hymn reminds us, Christ has welcomed us in. He's welcomed us in through a remarkable act of servanting. And so we respond this morning by being deeply grateful to him that though we had no rights to him, no, nothing to offer him, he has drawn us in. And so we give our thanks to him. So let's stand uh, to sing our last hymn and let's stand and we pray at the end.